Hey gang, Ross Brand here for LivestreamUniverse.com. Welcome to Livestream Stars, the show where we feature talented broadcasters delivering high quality content across Livestream Universe, Livestream platforms. <laughs> Brought to you by Livestream Universe, LivestreamUniverse.com. We have a change in the lineup tonight. We were originally scheduled to have Stephanie Liu on. She wasn't able to make it and one of the great things about this live streaming community is you start making friends with all sorts of talented people and one A-lister can't make it. And we're able to get another one at the last minute to step in. Todd Bergen is an awesome live streamer. I am so honored that you took the time, Todd, to join us. Let me give the bio to everybody and then we will get right into it. Todd Bergen is all about live video in the moment video, broadcasting, podcasting, email marketing, and engaging people to help them make life better. He's on a mission to help entrepreneurs and online creators get started engaging the world through the use of the internet, primarily live video. He's an outstanding interviewer with multiple podcasts that he records live and an advanced studio setup, setup that delivers high quality audio and video check out todd's free video marketing plan at todd.live and welcome my friend i want to have you on where we have a chance to promote it and set it up and all that kind of thing uh when i schedule my next season but why not have a bonus show since i had an opening and i'm so appreciative that you were able to jump in in the last minute and join us well i appreciate you having me ross and thank you for uh for the opportunity and thinking of me today to fill uh, Stephanie's position uh, as the guest for tonight. Um, I was just trying to share it uh, on my pages. I, you know what? I, I haven't used be live and I I'm, I'm usually the interviewer. So I have my whole method for, um, or, you know, or I do solo broadcast for sharing um, when I'm doing my own thing, but uh, I haven't ever been a, you know, this is the first time I've been a guest. So it's quite an honor uh, to do so on your show. Wow. Um, but I just shared it to my page and I don't want to steer up my phone through the whole beginning of the interview. So I'll share it to my personal page uh, when we get off, but uh, it is going to my Todd.live page right now. So, um, you know, it's a great thrill to be here. Awesome. We have Dr. Finch here. Patricia's here. Uh, welcome everybody. Please do uh, share this out as well. Throw some likes and some, some love and some wows into the chat. Uh, as we get things going here. And, you know, Todd, there was an interesting uh, live stream this morning. Annie Alexander uh, was live streaming about how she's a podcaster and how in podcasting you don't get quite as real as you do with live video because you can go back, you can produce it, you can, you can cut out your ahs and your ums, you can retake something, you can script it. Live is live, right? You get one shot at it. It is what it is. Um, and she was wondering, are people going to show up? Are they not going to show up? What makes people show up for uh, a live stream? Why do people like your live stream? She put the question out there to people. Um, and I, I, I thought, you know, this is a very difficult question. I ended up watching the whole thing, wondering if there was an answer uh, because I never really thought about it. Um, I don't know why people like my live streams or don't like my live streams. I focus on what I can control, which is, did I do enough to promote it? Did I select a good guest? Did I select interesting topics? Um, do you have a thought on why uh, some people take to one live streamer and not to another, even if the topics and the content and the knowledge of the person is pretty much within the same ballpark, right? Yeah. You know, I, I honestly don't. Okay. I got into podcasting in last November and I did, I think I did 39 podcasts for divorce, the workforce. I haven't done a podcast in about a, a little over a month. Um, I uh, have done live videos. Most of them have been solo broadcasts. I've done the one live video with you um, uh, as you're my first guest on create and engage, which we did the other day. I have Peter Nez coming tomorrow. Um, I, I can say this, that, um, I, I, honestly, I, I really don't have an answer as to why somebody would choose one person's over another. Um, the interesting thing is, is that so many people watch the live broadcast. For, okay, let's talk about Facebook and we'll just right. kind of narrow the, the focus. 
let's say Facebook. Okay. If I do a live video on Facebook, I might have, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20% that actually turn on the sound. Right. Um, so there's a lot of people that are watching the broadcast uh, that don't have the sound on, or maybe they, they, they just, they keep scrolling and they don't watch the whole thing, whatever, but they don't turn on the sound. So it would be hard to say that the sound quality has a major impact on whether somebody decides to watch the video or not, because um, most people are not turning on the sound to begin with. Um, and, you know, let's say you have 500 people that, uh, you know, take a look at your video and only 50 or 65 of them turn on the sound, um, you know, would the sound keep those 65, 50 to 65 people there? I think it would. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the topic has something to do with it. I think the, the sound quality has something to do with it. The guests, of course, have something to do with it. If you have some really big name in the internet on your show, I think obviously that's going to attract a lot more people uh, to stick around and, and turn on the sound than, than a smaller name. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of factors. Um, you know, you mentioned the podcasting as opposed to live video. Um, you know, I think she's right. There is maybe some more. Uh, the live video is less formal than the podcasting, um, which I think adds to the authenticity and the transparency and all that. Um, but I will say that with my broadcast, uh, when I was doing podcasting, which I, I still am, my, my live video shows are, are recorded for podcast, as you know. Um, and I'll start publishing those once I have, you know, five or seven episodes. I'll, I'll go on iTunes and make sure they're all there. And that's when I'll open it up. But um when I did my podcasting for Divorce Workforce without the live video component, it still was not scripted. I mean, I would I would research my guest if I wasn't aware of them prior to, you know, hitting the record button. Um, and I had some direction, but, you know, I would let the conversation go wherever it went. And if we went completely off topic or what I thought we were going to cover, um, then, uh, I would let that happen. And I would script the title for the, uh, for the podcast after the recording was over with. And, and that's one of the nice things about podcasting is, is that you're recording for something later. So if the topic goes way off base where you thought it would go, you can change your title to fit the show and it's all great. But when you're doing a Facebook live, you create your title before you go live and so, you know, I created one for you and I created one for, for, uh, professor Nez, but we may go way off that. Um, so I think with the live video, you stray a little bit, um, there's less formality and there's, you, you know, you just don't know where it's going to go. Yeah. Welcome everybody. Great to see Mitch Jackson, Sabrina Cadini, Michael A. Campbell, Sarah Wiseman, and everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We're talking with Todd Bergen from Todd.live. Um, and then there's just that intangible quality, whether it's um, likability, charisma, presence, all these things that I don't know whether you can teach or not teach. People can certainly get a little bit better at those things as they practice. Um, but it's not I, I always say live video isn't for everybody. Right. I mean, some people are going to come across better in a blog post. Some people are going to come across better in, you know, photog using photography, using podcasting that's more highly scripted. Um, although I do think, you know, most people, if they stick at it for a while, are going to get better and get more confident and get more comfortable. Um, but I, I do think there's certain intangibles that maybe everybody's game, so to speak, doesn't translate to live. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't I don't disagree. Um, and, you know, on the other hand, though, I, I think anybody can polish up yeah. and, and, and present for the camera. I mean, because there's all sorts of things that uh, we're not going to have right anyway that people are. And, and that's the other thing is people are very forgiving about, you know, what they see um, in live video. Uh, they're very forgiving if the sound isn't, you know, just the best. Uh, they're very forgiving if the signal is breaking up and, and you know, people are, are having trouble staying on with each other. Um, they're very forgiving if. Um, you know, it's a last minute presentation and you've got a guest who hasn't uh, changed out of his exercise clothes yet and is still wearing his ball cap and his, and his, uh, you know, I, and folks I don't know just, anybody like that. <laughs> just, folks, just so you know, when Ross contacted me today, he said, Hey, are you available at seven? And I said, yeah, I'm available at seven. I'd love to be on your show tonight. And I'm thinking seven, California, not seven, New York. And so 
we're having, I was testing something on my computer for a show I'm doing tomorrow with Professor Nez and I'm having a sound issue and, and I got Ross on the line and we're testing it a little bit and, and I realized he's ready to go at four o'clock my time. So I had planned on going and eating with my family and taking a shower, getting rid of the hat and everything and coming back. So, but people are forgiving, right? People are going to stick around and they don't care if I have my ball cap on or if I'm not fed, um, you know, they're going to have fun. Yeah. And I think they're forgiving very much in the video side because, um, I'm getting a little better at it, but for probably the first year of doing this, I had a vague idea maybe of looking at the camera, but very rarely did. Um, a little bit less forgiving on the audio if it's breaking up and you can't really hear, but people will stick around through some of the struggles, right? That may be technological, may be your struggles, whatever. Uh, they're not going to generally alive on, live. They're not going to leave you on the first time something isn't perfect, right? right? Um, and then it's, then it's all the techniques that you put to use to maintain an audience. And that's being prepared, having a good topic, having a good guest, um, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you're a tremendous interviewer. I've, I've listened to a lot of your shows. I've been on your show a couple of times. What is your approach to interviewing? How do you, do you know what sets you apart from, from other people? Because I, I consider you among the best that that's out there. Wow. That's a compliment, Ross. Thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. Um, maybe it's the Southern twang. I don't hear it myself, but everybody else does. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, um, I just have, a, I, I can talk. Uh, I'm not scared to talk. Um, I have a lot of things that come into my mind. I, you know, I hear th that, you know what, probably the number one thing for me, I don't know if this is what makes me a good interviewer or not, but I try really hard to listen um, and listen intently. I think, you know, when you, when I had you on my first pod or my, I think you were on my seventh episode of my divorce workforce podcast. And I don't remember if you mentioned it during the show or if it was, um, afterwards when we were chatting or maybe it was even another time, but one of the most important things I think I, I took from you during that show was, um, it's really important to listen to your guest, um, or whoever it is, you know, or your interviewer. Right. Um, and make sure that you hear what they're saying and that you don't somehow ask them something that they just said. Um, and I don't, I don't know that I've ever caught anybody doing that. And I sure hope I haven't done that. And one of the things I worried about when you, when you told me that was, gosh, did I do that to him already during this episode? And I was kind all. of throwing, no, I know you didn't, but listening to people, listening to what you're the, the people, whoever you're with is saying and thinking about it very quickly and trying to see if that's they say something that maybe gives you a new uh you know it could be a tangent or something something that's totally irrelevant to really what you're talking about that day but that could be really interesting about that person about that person's business or that person's day or their life or their family or whatever i mean people say all sorts of things and if you're running off a script of questions now when i do a podcast i usually have you know a bullet points of things that i want to hit certain things that I think would be really interesting to pull out of this person and, and to share with the, with the crowd. But a lot of the times these, you know, people tell you something that you, you, you couldn't really come up with if you hadn't talked to them first. Right. And it's really interesting, cool stuff that humanizes them, that, 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 that uh, people, things that people can relate and sympathize with. And, um, and it can really take the conversation into some interesting directions and I think that's happened a lot on my podcasts and because I'm, you know, not just do I have what I want to talk about and things I want to cover, but, you know, I'll throw all that out if we, if, you know, if my guest says something really cool that I hadn't considered and it's like, Hey, let's, let's run this down and see what we can get from this. And I think it makes for a good interview, quite honestly. Right. right. And I, I think like the way I go about it, it makes it easier for me to adjust on a fly and like, okay. 45 minutes ahead of time, I got contact you because basically, even if you were coming on the show, when you come on the show uh, next time, right, and there's five weeks or three months or however far ahead we book it, I'm not going to have a list of questions in front of me. And I'm not saying that everybody should do it this way, but I'm not going to have a list of questions in front of me. I'm going to do it pretty much the same way. I'm going to think of three segments or topics, open up with uh, talking about 
the issue from the podcast that or uh, live stream that I heard this morning, go into interviewing, and then we'll get into your gear and your setup and what you're working on and all that kind of stuff. But the answers and what I ask you based, is based on what I'm reading, like what I'm what you're talking about that's interesting, what the audience is reacting to. Um, I think for me, what helped is that when I when I worked in radio and and covered sports, I didn't necessarily know who I was going to get to interview after a game or, you know, even who would call into a show afterwards or something like that. So yet you have to start out with something general if you weren't totally sure what the person did and then figure it out and listen to them and, you know, work your way through it. So that's been that's been a big help. But I, I mean, you stand out, but that doesn't mean you don't prepare. Like when you have a guest, you learn about the guest, but not scripting the questions to where you're asking question two, no matter what they say to question one. And that's that's what stood out for me is how well you listen and how well prepared you are. And and you're genuinely interested in in the subject matter that relates to the person you're having on. And I think if you're not interested in the subject matter, then it's going to be harder to get the audience in many cases interested in it or make the the person that you're talking to feel like it's not just a chore of reading a list of questions so that you sure. can have another piece of, uh, of content. Um, are there other in- people out there who you've learned from, from, from watching them interview? Um, you know, I've listened to Pat Flynn, John Lee Dumas. Mm-hmm. I've listened to Joel Com. I've listened to, um, uh, well, I, well, I listened to, you know, I haven't listened to that many podcasts. Um, I listened to, uh, one called, it was by Gimlet Media called Startup. Um, it wasn't really an interview style podcast. Uh, Startup, I think, is one of the greatest things ever created. Um, I mean, if you haven't listened to Startup, the podcast, it's just called Startup. I mean, just go in iTunes and right. search for Startup. It is a phenomenal show. And I think there's a new season, which I haven't listened to yet. But no, I mean, I just do my own thing. And you had even mentioned a little bit ago about, you know, with podcasting as opposed to live video, you can edit out ums and ahs and this or that. And I think in, in the 39 episodes of interviews that I did, I think that I only edited out, uh, I could count on one hand how many times I edited any noises or issues in the middle of the podcast out. I I just left it as is. And I say I'm a lot. And, you know, right. if there's a if there's a silence for a moment, I just I just leave it in. Um, I had a call with a, a, a you know, a, an entrepreneur from Australia um, named uh, Ainsley Metcalf, and she and I had uh, connection issues with uh, Skype in the middle of it. Obviously, you're going to edit that out. Um, uh, you know, one time I mentioned where a guy was from and, and part of his advantage in his business is people not knowing where he's from. So right. I went in and kind of blurbed out where uh, where he's from when I mentioned it. But, um, you know, I just would leave it as is and and I just wing it. And, um, you know, like I said, I have bullet points and, you know, if I hit him, I hit him. If I don't, I don't. When right. I when I was with you the other day uh, on my program, uh, Create and Engage, I didn't have anything. I mean, but I also know you. Right. So, right. Um, you know, I wasn't charting, uh, you know, I, we we talked about some new stuff, I think. But definitely, um, you know, I think the more the more I do this, the less I'll have any notes. I mean, there's people I know that I haven't even met in person that I don't think I'd need any notes to interview them. I just would just wing it. And right. Have right. fun. And, and, you know, different people have different styles. I mean, when I look down through some of the people that are here, um, you know, Mitch Jackson from the show dot live with Jen Hoverstead, they do great interviews and they do a different style because it's team interviews going back and forth. But um, I consider their show like one of the top interview shows on on live streaming. Um, Zeff is a terrific interviewer also who's here. Um Claudia Santiago does a lot of solo streams, but she's very engaging interviewer. Uh, been on her show several times, so you know there's a lot of different people who who do it a different way, but are are very good at it. I don't think there's there's one right or wrong way to do it, but you know you're doing a, a tremendous job with it. And let let's move into the larger the larger strategy, right? Because you've chosen. Um, to go the high quality audio, high quality video, really put the time and effort and investment into setting up a studio. Yes. Um, 
well beyond anything that I've even considered, right? And I, I think it's fantastic. Your podcasts sound amazing. Um, your ability to do different things with your graphics and your switching shots and all that uh, is ahead of the crowd. What made you decide to go that route rather than just let me get on and get going and then I'll learn it as I go? Well, you know, um, when I got into live video, it was at the end of 2015 and um, it was when I was starting a business uh, called Divorce the Workforce. And I still have that going, but I'm I'm not really behind it. I'm kind of pivoting into the Todd.Live and everything live video. And that's that's that happened because I got started promoting that that business and and my my message with that business. But my I quickly realized that my passions with the video and the equipment and um, and figuring this stuff out more than it is what divorce the workforce is about. And, and you know, if people are wanting to work with me and divorce the workforce, I'm I'm going to do it. But um, and I may get more behind that brand because what I was doing was I was splitting. I was really focused on live video when I was promoting that van brand and not really promoting that brand. Um, but what happened was for me, uh, I was let's see, you know. I had a sync issue when I first got on live video. I had a couple iPads. I wanted to go live on multiple platforms. I knew that right off the bat. And I was going live on Facebook, Periscope and Meerkat when Meerkat was still going. And um, I was only doing Meerkat because YouTube live wasn't there yet. And I wanted to do YouTube live was going to be the third iPad. So I had three iPads and I had to get sound of the three. And I wanted it to be good quality sound. So then there's a mixer. And then what's the problem? You know, all three iPads are running off Wi-Fi, so I need something more than that. So I need the laptop and I need Wirecast. And it just it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And so, yes, now I have a very – the one thing I will say that if you look at my video right now while we're online, um, behind me, you know, I haven't worked on my backdrop. My lighting isn't where I want it to be. I have one Diva ring light. But, you know, I'm down to the lighting and the backdrop. Um I've got the sound, I've got the video, unless I want to upgrade to 4K video, which I don't know if it's worth the price when I already have these great HD cameras um, that I've got. But, um, it, you know, it just became a mission. And what really drove it more than anything, and, and I didn't realize it until a couple months ago even, was that no matter how good I get it, I really can't control the latency with the sound between what you hear and where my mouth is. Sometimes Facebook gets it right and sometimes they don't. Some Periscope always seems to get it right. Um, uh, YouTube, I think so far, seems to get it right. But with, with Facebook, you know, it drives me nuts when what you hear coming out of my mouth is five seconds after you see it. And, you know, I was, I, I was on a constant push to get rid of that lag. And it went from, you know, strengthening my Wi-Fi and strengthening my internet to getting a computer and, and plugging in directly into the, the ethernet cables and, you know, just doing, getting the software right and tweaking the software. And it was a mission to eliminate the, the delay. And, right. um, you know, of course, what I've realized is that's an impossibility. You can't always control that. But, yeah, and and Wirecast because I I know you use Wirecast. You can sort of try and sync it up by delaying. Is it delaying the audio? Delaying the video? There's certain things you can do, I believe, within within Wirecast. But the problem is that the problem is on Facebook's end, right? It's not on your end. So if you do that, then you're going to screw it up for how it goes out to Periscope. And YouTube, bottom line is Facebook's got to step it up and improve the quality of yeah. the video. And maybe it's just because of the number of users they have and everything else. Although not like nobody's using uh, <laughs> YouTube. There's there's a few people on YouTube and Periscope and Twitter and all that stuff. But for whatever reason, those, those uh, platforms, not only is the video higher quality, but it retains its quality which is why I always immediately download what I do uh, if I go straight to Facebook Live and then put it up on YouTube because I know the quality won't degrade. And so it, if nothing else, YouTube is a backup in case, you know, everything else got destroyed or something sure. like that. But Facebook, the quality isn't as good when you stream it, and then it continually gets less good. Over yeah. time. <laughs> well, you're right. And that, that's another thing, too, that that drove my passion for the live video studio and trying to figure this stuff out and get it right. And, and let me tell you, 
and you know this, I'm, this is really for the benefit of your guests who don't know me or had this have had this conversation with me, but um, there wasn't any information on the internet on how to do this. I mean, right. there, there were pieces here and there. Um, I got a lot of information from reading Cliff Ravenscraft's um, podcast Answer Man page. Um, and actually, uh, I did take his uh, $2,000 podcast Answer Man class. Um, I've have met Cliff. Uh, at, I had lunch with him and a few other people at Social Media Marketing World to, a year, almost two years ago. Uh, I lucked out and got to go uh, with all these uh, big names and, and just had a great time. But, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to get the audio right. I knew Cliff was the place to go. Um, but his was directed towards podcasting. And fortunately, there's a lot of overlap with the video. But there were things that I had to figure out that I couldn't find online and that Cliff doesn't address. There was, there was plenty on video that I had to figure out on my own that I couldn't find online. Um, so not that it doesn't exist. I'm sure there's, you know, scores of other guys like me who wanted to figure all this out and have, um, and maybe have even put it up on prominent blogs that I just never discovered, but I wanted to be a pioneer in, in putting together a lot of this stuff and, um, and just have fun with it. Um, but, uh, one of the important things to me was in, to your point on Facebook and the quality of Facebook, look, Facebook, I think is the place to be for live video right now. They're, they're knocking it out of the ballpark with, um, you know, viewership and, um, and sharing. And, and I mean, it's just, it's a great platform for getting your message out there. And I think if I had to choose one, it would be Facebook, but I didn't want to choose one. I mean, when I got started with the iPads, I wanted to, I wanted four or five. I wanted to be on Meerkat, Periscope, Facebook Live, uh, YouTube. They kept talking about, it was going to be called YouTube Connect or YouTube. It was going to be called YouTube something. It wasn't going to be called just YouTube Live, but, um, right. The, the YouTube. And then there was Spreecast. I saw Gary Vaynerchuk uh, do his, I think he called it the Super 8 broadcast when um, when his, his book came out. And Spreecast was one. So I was trying to think, okay, do I need to be on Spreecast? So I wanted to be on as many places as I could be at one time. Okay, then there's a great thing about that. Um, there's negatives and there's positives. One of the, a couple of the great things are, um, to your point about Facebook video quality. Well, if I'm live on Facebook and YouTube at the same time, YouTube is giving me YouTube quality. Right. And when the when the broadcast is over with, it's cataloged in YouTube just like it would be if I had uploaded it. In fact, it eliminates all those steps. And the nice thing about YouTube is, is you can put in all your show notes, all your tags, everything prior to the broadcast. So when you go live, you just hit the stream button and all those tags are relevant in search now. The title's relevant in search. They're getting good uh, 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 um 1080p they're getting you know it's 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 the best um they're getting the good sound and it's all live um at the same time that facebook's getting it at the same time periscope's getting it um i've actually figured out a workaround for instagram live uh but there's some downsides there as well um but when i go live those are the four places that i send it periscope facebook youtube and uh, and instagram um and but the only one I monitor for comments, I, well, I monitor too. I monitor Periscope and I monitor Facebook. I don't monitor YouTube. It's just I can't do a third one. Um, and Instagram, actually, I I monitor Instagram. Uh, I'm able to do that as well. Um, but I can't put the the words up on the screen like if I were using V Live people's comments. I can't do any of that. But I I kind of feel like if I'm going to put an hour into a broadcast, I want it to go to as many places as possible whether I can pay attention to the comments or not, it, it you know, people are going to find it. They're either going to stick around or they're not, but why not get four places at once? And why not eliminate, like, I love not having to go to YouTube later and do that silly work around and downgrade or download the downgraded video off YouTube and, or Facebook and send it back up to YouTube. I used to do that and I don't want to do that. I'd rather it just go, go straight there. So you know, I've been on a mission for that and you give up a few things, but you get some other things and it's really what's important to you. So just to recap, you use the the iPad to go to Instagram, but yes. the other iPads are to read the comments. You're using well, I, Yes. Last year I bought five or seven iPads <laughs> um, so I, in this mission of being everywhere. Um, so I bought, and they're all iPad mini fours. So it's great mm -hmm. because I have all these little tripods and I've got the right, the right, uh, adapter, uh, clamp at the top for all of them. And, and so I've got, I mean, I've got like, I've got a ton of these. Okay. I have a ton of them. Um, but yes, I have, um, when you, cause I use Wirecast 
to send the signal to a place called Switchboard Live, which their product is called Joycaster. And Joycaster will send it wherever I want it. If I want it to go to 30 places, I can make that happen through Joycaster. Um, I don't want it to go to 30 places. I want it to go to four. Uh, well, I only get to do three through Wirecast. Um, Periscope, Facebook, and YouTube. Um, so I, uh, that's what I do. I, I use Joycaster for that. Now, for Instagram Live, what I do is, is I run sound out of my mixer into an iPad uh, directly into the iPad, and then I point one iPad at the next one, and the camera from one iPad is recording the camera from the other one. Now, what that does is, because it's recording Facebook, and actually I'm going to try it tomorrow with Periscope and see if it's any better, but Facebook has a slight delay where YouTube and Periscope don't seem to, and I might be wrong on that, but I'm going to find out tomorrow, I think. Um, there's a slight delay. So people on Instagram were complaining about a latency. There was, a, there was like a five-second delay between whatever I said and what they were seeing on screen. Well, they were getting sound directly from my mixer into, into Instagram. So there was no right. delay there unless there's a slight built-in delay with Instagram. But with Facebook, we know there's a delay. And so the sound wasn't coming from the Facebook, though. It was coming from the, from the Instagram or uh, from the mixer. So uh, that's one of the downsides there. But I had a ton of interactions on Instagram, despite the delay. I mean, people did let me know there was the delay, but people were commenting and they were listening and having fun. I was actually really surprised. I had better, um, I mean, but aside from Facebook, my, my best viewership was on Instagram live despite that delay. And it was great. Now, if they open up their API, then I'm going to be able to send my signal directly to Instagram, which will be great. Right. Right. Um, but what people are seeing right now with your broadcast, with the split screen and the lower thirds and whatever that BeLive gives you, that's what I was sending to YouTube and to Periscope and to Instagram. And particularly on Periscope and Instagram, those are things that people aren't used to seeing. They're used to seeing somebody point a camera at them, and it's like a crude image that's shaking all around. <laughs> um, but what they're seeing on Periscope when they watch my broadcast is the split screen with the lower thirds and whatever I do. And it's a professional style broadcast on those platforms. So I, I kind of think it's fun. That's fantastic. Um, welcome, Jen Nelson. Welcome, Brad Friedman. Welcome, Alfredo. Uh, guys, if you want to jump in and ask Todd a question on camera, uh, check out the pinned uh, post in the comments, the pinned comment or whatever you call it. Uh, you can just click that link. It'll take you into the lobby or green room kind of thing. And then I can bring you up. And if you want to ask Todd a question, he's a great resource as a, an amazing setup as you're, you're hearing. Um, what would you say if you had to narrow it down are the key pieces of equipment that anybody who wants to do uh, a good quality that maybe they're not striving to be at the level you're at. Maybe they're not striving for uh, the highest quality, but they want to do a solid broadcast. What are the, the main pieces of equipment and gear and software that you would say Everybody who wants to do this at more than just a very casual level ought to ought to get. Well, you okay? Well, you've obviously you've got two sides of it. Um, you've got audio and you've got video. I mean, I think right. that's where you start. Um, I think with audio, there is no compromise. Um, you know, if you have to, if you insist, I can help you compromise. But with audio, you, you just need to get your audio wired tight, okay? That's going to require a microphone, and it doesn't have to be an expensive one. Um, I like the Heil PR40. Um, I've got two of them, um, and I got this on there. Uh, look, Cliff Ravenscraft, Cliff Ravenscraft's class and his equipment uh, suggestions are all spot on. I went with a lot of what he said. Um, I have done a lot of my own stuff beyond what he talks about. But I mean, you're going to need a microphone. You're going to need a mixer, depending on the microphone you buy. If you buy a microphone with a USB, you don't necessarily need the mixer, but then your hands are tied in a lot of ways. Um, the mixer gives you a lot of freedom to do all sorts of cool things. For instance, I have a, I have one of my iPods is, or iPads is a designated jukebox and I will buy music so that I can use it free and clear for eternity. Right. And I like to chop it up and use it the way I use it. And I have a I have a jukebox on there, and I have all the different songs and sounds and things. And I can push a button and play however whatever I want to play. It's mine. Uh, I don't own it. I own a license to use it, but right. um, I uh, you know I I can do that. Um, 
you know, on the video, it depends on what you want to do. I don't like the cameras in, in computers. I mean, not that they're horrendous, but I just don't like using them. I don't like the angle that I get from a laptop camera or over above on it. Like I've got a 27 inch monitor on my left here. I don't like that. So I want a different kind of a camera. So, I mean, um, you know, what are you going to do there? If you use a camera or a camcorder, now you're going to be in for capture cards and extra cords and extra figuring stuff out and maybe even having to use wirecast. So look at a minimum, let's say that you just want to break the ice. Uh, I probably would go with like an iPad mini and a lavalier mic and you're going to get great sound and, and then definitely get something like a, uh, one of these jobs, uh, Archon mount. Uh, you know what? I don't, I'm an Archon mount. Um, I've, I, you know, you go and use Todd, Todd live and, uh, you know, I get a commission. I know you've got Ross brand and you, and we saw Dr. Finch. She's got, we all have one, right? We all right. have uh, Archon mounts. I need to get some Archon equipment so I can promote it. Cause it's great stuff. I bought this stuff prior to even knowing about Archon, but, um, you know, you want to stabilize whatever device you're using for your picture, um, you want to stabilize if you can your sound. If you're using a lavalier mic, you can clip it or you can hold. I've seen people hold it and do interviews and have it go back and forth, and right. that works well. Um, but you know, sound, and you want your video to be stable, and you want your sound, and you want your lighting. Uh, I'm very dissatisfied with my lighting right now, um, but you know what? I'm I'm going to go live. And actually, I wanted to comment on Mitch Jackson made a comment. Um, he likes my approach on live video, play, test, and learn. I'll tell you one thing I wish I would have done in this year and a half that I've been working on this studio is I wish the word share would have been at the end of play, test, learn, and then share. I, I kept a lot of my frustration to myself and didn't air it and have people come along with me on this journey to see what it was I went through to put this together. And maybe they would have been able to offer me advice. Uh, I think it was a huge opportunity lost and that's why I've decided in the future, there's no more of that. If, if, if the sound's not working right or whatever, I'm going to do the best I can get through it. And maybe people will learn from all the places I stub my toe and have problems, but I really haven't shared a good portion of my journey and man alive. That was, I think that was a, a huge mistake to just kind of like show up and everything's working just right. Uh, and it isn't, as we know, we are having a sound issue today. I, I'm hoping I can go live with professor Nez tomorrow at nine in the morning. Like I plan to. Uh, but I got to figure out my sound, um, but something's amiss today. And, um, you know, I think that's just part of dealing with this uh, technology. You never, I mean, I might've bumped a button and screwed everything up. Uh, who knows? Well, even with you not necessarily sharing every step of the journey, um, Brad Friedman says over the past year or so, Todd has been very generous sharing what he learns on this journey. I've benefited from his generosity and appreciate it a lot so people are paying attention to what you have shared and and learning from it uh dr finch says she loves her mounts <laughs> uh welcome jose uh mitch says hindsight is 2020 enjoyed hearing your journey because it's one that's similar to many of ours and i think also for people who are are trying to save money i think there as you learn more about the equipment you can see where you can compromise and where you where you don't, right? So, for instance, I got a uh, – this is a $49 microphone. Right. I know that if I got a $500 microphone uh, with the setup I have, I'm not going to sound $450 better. I might sound 20 or 30 or 40 So I'm going to get there at some point but I'll need to buy a fairly expensive interface or a, a, a really nice mixer and, and do some other things. But with the setup that I now have, I know that this is probably almost as good as I would get if I, if I went up a step, right? I don't, I don't disagree. It, it just depends on, on, you know, what your objectives are, what you're willing to do, what other, what, what parts of life you're willing to financially sacrifice to, to <laughs> right, get right. whatever, you know, to get to the level that you choose you want to be at. Um, you know, I, I just tend to take things to a level of, of perfection that it just kind of gets stupid. I mean, it's like, I mean, I had when I, to be quite honest with you. Okay, I have the reason I mentioned a few minutes ago. I have two of these microphones. These are three hundred fifty dollar uh, dollar microphones. I've got two mixers. I've got two uh, compressors with the limiters and gates in them. I've got. I mean, I have doubles of a lot of this stuff. And the reason why is is because 
I got into podcasting after a live video and I was scared to mix the two on the same equipment. Right. Um, I felt like, you know what, I want to have one button, like Jen just said, she's, she's been talking about one darn button. Okay. I was trying to do that as much as I could. So I had one desk with all my podcast stuff on it, all set up to where all I had to do was touch a couple buttons and go. And I would have this awesome podcast recorded beautifully, sounds great, uploaded everything the way I need it to be. And then when I want to go on live video, I go sit at another table and I have all my live video equipment and I can press one or two buttons and it's all going and it's ready to go. Okay. Now there was a problem with that in the long run for me, just my sanity and space really isn't an issue because I've got a, I, it's a long story I won't get into, but I've got 1600 square feet that I can do whatever I want with it. And I've got tons right. of room that's not being used. Um, but um, so space wasn't the issue, but it was really just um, and quite honestly, it was when I decided that I wanted to do a podcast within a live video. So that's what create and engage is. I, it's a live video, but I'm recording. So in the middle, well, five minutes into it or so, I'm going to start up the podcast and I'll do a little countdown, play the music. We're going to go into podcast kind of mode and and I'm going to actually not reference things on the screen so that people listening to the podcast aren't going to be like, well, wait, I can't see it. Um, I don't want to make a podcast where it you miss out on the whole thing because it's visual. Um, and then at a certain point when I feel like we've gone long enough, I'll wind up the podcast close out the music and then keep recording live video. If we still have things to talk about uh, that keeps on going. Um, how do I do all that? If I'm on two different, if I've got a podcast studio and a live video studio. So one day I rolled up my sleeves and I'm like, I am going to figure this out. And I mean, I spent 14 hours one day sorting it all out. And by the end of the day, I figured it out. And it's awesome. I mean, it's so much simpler than I ever thought it would be, even though it's extremely complicated. Kind of right. once you get back from it and come back in and like you do it and you solve it, it's like it's a no brainer. And I was terrified of that um, initially. Um, but, uh, you know, one of your guests, uh, I, I haven't I got to find out it was Brad Friedman. One of your guests, he says he has a Behringer mixer. Um, I have a Mackie mixer and I could probably help you out with your Behringer, um, mixers are, um, they're all, and you can, you can PM me through Facebook if you'd like, uh, this week and, and we can try to get a dialogue going on that. But mi mixers are very scary initially. And they're scary when you have an issue like today, you and I were experiencing static on our call right. and, and I got to solve that. Um, and I was experiencing static once I rebooted everything and I wasn't on a call. So it's obviously on my end. But, um, you know, they're very simple. It's just when you have a problem, there's so many things to check. It's just one of those things that you get it set up and you get it where you want it and you don't touch it again. I mean, you just don't even mess with it. You don't go near it. Um, and you know, if you can put it in a safe and lock the box and have the cords run out a little hole, that might even be ideal. That'd make me sleep better at night if I could have that. Um, but, uh, I'd be happy, uh, uh, Brad, I think it was Brad. If you'd like me to help you with your Behringer, um, I might be, I might be of some service with that, but yeah, YouTube videos, that's where I learned to set up mine. Yeah. And I, you know, one of the, one of the areas that I didn't, uh, look for sort of a lower cost option was when it came to getting an encoding software, I tried OBS, used it for a little while. And then I said, you know, I'm going to spend the money on Wirecast because I just felt like I was going to go there eventually anyway. So why take the time to learn another system for a while? And that was one of the best, best decisions um, I made because it allowed me to do updates and all different kinds of both live and produced broadcasts that I couldn't have done without it. So um, I do think there's picking and choosing for people who are budget conscious, but I think if you can do it, what Todd has done is amazing. I mean, to have that kind of a studio set up um, and, and the results you see it in his, in his broadcasts. Um, I want to mention Claudia. It's kind of a long comment, but I wanted to throw this in there. Our challenge has been to do live shows that involve live music and production and the platforms changing so much. Uh, but we've managed to work uh, live tech. We've managed to work live with uh, live tech production to make it work. Um, so it's complicated whether you're coming from talk show angle, whether you're coming uh, from music angle, probably even more complicated. Um, but like you said, um, 
YouTube videos. Uh, you know where else you can you can get great information. And I I've never played an online game in my entire life, but there's a lot of gamers that figured this stuff out for live streaming on Twitch and stuff. And that's kind of when I first started learning OBS. That that's who I had to learn from because there weren't really a lot of videos by live streamers doing the type of streaming, you know, talk show streaming and that kind of stuff. So you can always check out what's out there as far as uh, some of these gamers tutorials. Even if you don't have any idea what the game they're talking about, you want to get scrolling text on your screen or something. They figured out how to do it. Yeah, I mean, Twitch is is pretty awesome. I I haven't I I haven't even used them that much, and I, I've been thinking about broadcasting there because they've got a creator section now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm with you. I I used OBS for a while too, um, but I didn't like the lack of support, and um, there were it just had obvious limitations. I was pulling my hair out with it all the time, um, and some of the things that I was pulling my hair out uh, with OBS had to do with nothing. OBS. I mean, it, this this going back to the latency thing with the sound. You know, I think there were things that I thought were OBS's fault or my fault in running OBS that were just not a problem with OBS or with me. They were. It was just Facebook. I, taking I think the that's signal. what I encountered as, as yeah. well. That um, having been said, I'm still happy I have Wirecast because I like the ability to set up all those shots and see them in front of you and all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, Wirecast. And you know what? This is this is going to make me sound like a total novice. Um, but you know what? There's no end to learning. But to just today in Wirecast, I learned how to combine uh, sources, uh, as many sources as I want, into one shot. Now, that sounds like something very novice to me, right? But it... You know what? I've been using Wirecast now for six or eight months, and I've set up everything individually. Like if I have a lower third, that's been its own individual shot. Right. And I would put that over top of, you know, and I would stack them in the layers. For those of you who don't know, what you do is you create all these shots in the layers, and each layer can have multiple shots. And within that layer, whatever selected can be the only shot that's being broadcast at the time. So I would have all these layers, like I'd even have five or seven different layers for each individual thing. Well, just today I thought, you know what? Uh, Cause I want to do this. There's an animation that I have right. to encourage people to turn the sound on, on Facebook when I'm live. And I wanted to use that, but it was hard if that's in its own layer and it's its own shot to use it with other things. And I've got to click four different things in order to use that. So I thought, gosh, there's gotta be a way. So I called up Wirecast and they have a premium support. It's like a hundred bucks a year. And I, I did buy it and I probably will always buy it. Um, because they're so above and beyond. It's just, it's just, it's a hundred dollars worth spending. Trust me, folks, the time that you will save. Um, and Hey, I have affiliate link links on my website. I don't generally promote my affiliate links, but if you decide to go by Wirecast, go to Todd.live and click it and, and pass through. I don't know, Ross, if you have it, um, I'm sorry if I'm. No, no, uh, no. Even if I, I do have it, but you're the guest today. So oh. check out Todd.live and, you know, you've, he's got a great resources page, by the way. So check that out, uh, Wirecast, and um, yeah. you know, if you need web services, all sorts of different resources Todd has on 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 his website, and definitely check that out. Well, Todd. Thank you. Yeah, but so today I called him up and I said, "Hey, there's got to be a way to combine these sources into one shot." So if I want to do. And, and uh, you can watch Todd.Live tomorrow if you want to see the graphic. I don't think I'll use it a bunch, but um, but if it, it's a combined shot of me and my guest and my lower thirds and this animated uh, image that comes in. And instead of having to click three or four different things or have all these different things running, I have this one shot for it all. And it, it's like, gosh, how did I not think of that six months ago? How did I not figure that out six months ago? And here I've... I consider myself a, a professional, but then there's like things that seem so basic. And that's the thing about live video. When you really start to roll up your sleeves and dig into the things like Wirecast, when you're using the professional uh, software and professional hardware, there's so many things that as you teach, because I mean, you're having to teach yourself these things. I've taught right. myself almost everything, folks. I have had two resources, well, three resources that I've used as soundboards and 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 to ask questions. Ross is one of them. I that's how I got in touch with Ross when I first met Ross. Um, I had a question that I saw something that he had done and I was trying to emulate it to some degree. Um, Stephen Haywood, um, who uh, uh, he's just all over with live video. He's fabulous. 
Cliff Ravenscraft for the sound and then the rest of YouTube. So four sources, YouTube <laughs> and, and, and I'm, otherwise I'm self-taught and on most of what I've done, I've, I'm self-taught. So if I don't think about a problem to solve, like today, stacking sources into one shot, uh, it just didn't occur to me to do that until I started trying to do more complicated things. And then it's like, all of a sudden I need to solve this. And it's like, wow, that was easy. I, I could have made something more brilliant six months ago if I would have known that. But I didn't know that, right? There's so many talking about layers. And when, when Todd's talking about layers, he's talking about like within one shot, you can have different layers. So you lay on top of the picture graphics and on top of everything you lay, you know, the, the bottom layer is usually your, your audio because it doesn't matter whether you see it or not. And then visually everything layers based on how you want it to appear. Um, but Wirecast itself has so many layers. Uh, there is so much you can do that I haven't even touched yet. I mean, I'm just happy when I use it that I get the audio on the air and that it's in sync, right? But yeah. there, there are now with the latest versions of Wirecast, you can get in there and you, you have like a whole equalizer and you can, you can pretty much do all sorts of things with audio just within Wirecast. It's amazing. Um, it, it, there's so much you can do. I, I can't even start. <laughs> Well, you know, it's going to be my mission to figure all this stuff out as time goes by. I'm sure they'll have a new edition coming up. In fact, when I was on with them today, they were talking about some stuff they were planning on putting into the next edition, uh, which will be, I guess, Wirecast 8. Um, but, you know, it's a $500 program, which is a huge commitment, and it's a thousand or 100 bucks for the telephone support. I think if you're going to, if you're going to, you know, put out the 500 bucks, I think the extra 100 bucks is worth uh, because I mean, you get premium support on the telephone almost immediately on rare occasion. They call me back and I'm not a rep for Wirecast folks. I, I don't, I mean, you know, the only way I'd get anything out of it is, is if, if you click a link at wire on my website for the Wirecast, um, for the, uh, you know, for the URL, but, um, uh, that gives me credit, but I mean, I, I love it whether or not I'm a, you know, a, a, an affiliate of theirs or not. I mean, it's, it's just such a great piece of software, the things that it can do and the things that I know it, well, there's things that I don't know that it can do that I'm going to learn right. that are just going to dazzle me and hopefully other people. But, um, you know, it's, it's been a lot of fun. OBS, um, probably can do a lot of the same things, but a lot of it, it can't. And, uh, I think there's a lot of limitations and one of the big ones is just the, the lack of support. I mean, you can go on the OBS forums and, and type a question and you might get a response a year later. Um, you know, <laughs> So, um, but you know, it all depends on what you want to do. I mean, now we've got BeLive, right? And I think BeLive is fabulous. I've used it. I think I used it once. Um, the obvious limitations are it doesn't go everywhere. It, you know, it's got BeLive um, branding on it, which I really don't mind. But if I was repurposing it a hundred places, I don't know that I would want it there. But um, I love that you can put comments up. I can't do that. Um the ease in which you can split screens and do trifectas with people and whatnot. I, I can't do it as easily. I can do it, but not as easily. Um, but uh, I think B is a great place for people to get started quite honestly. Yeah. Thank you, Nick, for that, that nice comment. Um, you know, one of the things that like uh, Doug was saying, he, he thought OBS was pretty easy to use. I, I think I learned, I taught myself OBS in order to get, the image and bring it in and bring Skype in and all that stuff within a few hours, it was then getting it to the next level and following where your shots are and the audio, which probably had nothing to do with OBS because it's still an issue sometimes with Wirecast. Um, but after you get to a certain point to go to the next level, it gets tough on OBS unless your mind can hold the image of all these different scenes you've set up and stuff like that where wirecast it just lays them all out in front of you and you can kind of visually remember where you're going to go next <laughs> i don't know i find it a little more user friendly but you're paying you're definitely paying a premium it's money that. well spent if you have it it's money well yeah. spent if you have it and you know what where there's a will there's a way i mean everybody's got financial limitations and i get that but look if you truly want something you can make things happen you can find ways to do it and everything doesn't have to be done at one time i mean you know you can piece together things i mean you know if all you have is an ipad 
but ultimately you want to be on wirecast and broadcasting to say multiple places okay get your ipad and get your mixer when you can afford to get your mixer and get the cord that runs from the mixer to the ipad um and of course you're gonna have to have your microphone or maybe you have your lavalier or whatever but that can go into the mixer but you right. can start up in your game piece by piece and i'm not saying that's easy i i did i did it but didn't in a way like i didn't share my journey but i mean you know you got to decide on what you want and if just work to make that happen. Um, you know, I'm sure that if I would have bought a different microphone and used it for five months and then I bought the Heil that somebody would have been interested in, you know, I know enough live streaming people now that somebody might've had a use, you know, I'm not going to get top dollar for it, but somebody out there might have a use for it. The other thing too is, is, you know, my, live video studio is, is not at my house, but I have a space in my house right. for a live video studio. Uh, it's a much smaller space and I intend to use it. And you know, like I said before, I had all this podcast equipment and that was on a separate desk and I had all this video equipment. Well, all that stuff I doubled up on is all I'm going to have one set of it all is going to go to my house and I'm going to have not quite as nice of a situation going is at my condo, but it'll allow me to go live at night with people when they're on wiki key or, or whatever. And, um, and I have some good stuff. So uh, a lot of the times things you buy that you think it's not really what you want, or it's not, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not the best or whatever. It doesn't mean that you won't have a purpose for it later. Right. So, you know, just do the best you can. Um, you know, I'll help people out, figure out whatever the basics or, or the best uh, I'll do whatever. The one level I haven't taken it to, I think is what one group out there calls level four. I don't have any of the level four equipment. I don't have any of the professional switchboards or anything like that, but um, I don't know that I need it quite honestly at the stage that I'm at. So that's having a computer or some sort of dedicated machine. That's just for live streaming. It's built right. for live streaming rather than having say a desktop computer with a lot of power, but it's still a desktop computer that you're using as a desktop computer. This Someday. is where you get like Wirecast gear or whatever, but that's like a five thousand dollar investment or something. Oh yeah, it, it's crazy, and I, I'm confident that that's in my future. That that's where mm -hmm. I will head at some point. But right now, you know what? I, I'm I'm pretty much content um, with what I have. I, I don't I don't feel the need to buy anything right now. But yes, I'm sure I'll get the itch at some point to. I'll see something somebody's doing out there and I won't have what it takes to do it. And I'm going to go figure it out. Will there be a course coming or consulting I'm, or how can people, uh, you know, who want to get more, uh, more information, how can they find out from you and how can they learn from you? I am happy to work with people now. Um, you know, depending on what's going on, I do consultation. Um, you know, I do paid consultation. Um, but you know, it's case by case right now. I mean, if, if somebody just has a quick question, I'm just going to be happy to help them. But if somebody's wanting me to help them build a studio and wants to take a significant amount of my time, then we could talk about that. But, you know, I don't know if there'll be a course or, you know, I, you know, I'm sure all that course book, you know, downloadable materials, maybe, you know, a series of videos, you know, with a, with a, uh, you know, a price of entry, I, you know, all that is possible. Absolutely. Um, because I, you know, I, I, I want to, uh, you know, I've got to, got to feed my kids, <laughs> but, um, you know, um, you pay for that big wire cast. Gear. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. If I want to up the game, I'm going to have to have a way to pay for it. Um, this has been a real struggle. I mean, I look, I'm not loaded. I'm fortunate that I have another business. Um, but you know, I, we have a single income family and, and I've figured, and I have two kids that are teenagers, but I've figured it out. And, um, you know, it's, it's been a real struggle. Um, but, uh, it's what I wanted and it's what I wanted to make happen. But, you know, people can come to me with their objectives and, um, and I can help craft things that are going to work for their objectives, whether it's something much simpler or something much more advanced. Um, either way, there's things that I've learned along this journey that will help people go straight to what they want without all the trial and error and frustration. And let me tell you, sometimes the, just the sound frustrations, the audio frustrations that I had with some of this stuff would be two or three months figuring it out. And, and it's just right. like, my gosh, if I can help somebody do that in an afternoon or a weekend, then certainly there's a, you know, a, a price of entry to just, Hey, just jump from, from, uh, from start to, uh, to awesome. 
Right. Um, you know, and I can do that. That's what Cliff does. You know, Cliff podcast answer man that I referenced before, you know, I could have figured out how to do the podcast stuff. Uh, I actually figured it all out except for, I didn't want to try to figure out how to send my podcast, uh, to Stitcher, iTunes, Google, all the different places, how to, how to, uh, edit it and all that, um, in audacity. That's what I paid Cliff for was, was right. to shortcut me on a handful of things. It was worth the $2,000 for him to get me there because I figured everything else out. It took me three, four months. It was like, my God, am I going to spend three more months doing this? Or am I just going to pay some two grand and get me there, you know, right now? Right. Right. Well, so, you're Cliff doing, wonderful. you're doing phenomenal work. Um, you're, you're going to be just taking off and I mean, the sky's the limit based on what I've seen over the past six months to a year. Um, you. you do phenomenal interviews. You've got an awesome studio set up, you know, your gear, um, you're supportive of other people in the community and it's, it's an honor to have you on the show and I'm definitely going to have you back next season, uh, where we can promote it and do all that kind of stuff. But I, I really appreciate you jumping in and, uh, you know, really lending your expertise and sharing your setup and how you came to, uh, you know, get to where you're at because it's it's not been easy, but you've made a tremendous amount of progress in, in a short period of time. And now you've got a, a polished studio set up and, and really high quality audio and video. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what you're going to do next. And it's Todd Bergen. Thank you so much, Todd. Todd.live is the website. Check out his resources page. If you're interested in Wirecast, if you're interested in software, gear, he's got a lot of different resources there. And uh, of course, what's what's next on the podcast front for you? Uh, well, as long as I can get the uh, sound going, Professor Nez is tomorrow. The Create and Engage podcast is my latest podcast, um, and it's about all things uh, online, create, and engage. My, mostly live video, but look, I do a lot of social media. I'm learning how to edit clips um, and create um, video clips of all kinds, whether I'm using them in live video presentations or on YouTube or whatever. So um, create and engage. I think, I think engaging with the folks out there, that's the point of doing this. Um, so I'm going to be talking to people who are professionals at creating content, engaging with the content they create. Uh, I also have another podcast, which I don't know when I'm going to get started, but at some point it's just, you know, kind of an ask Todd. I mean, everybody's got an ask, ask John, ask Pat, ask whoever, you know, kind of a five minute deal. I'm, but the, my twist will be, it'll be a live video, right. but it'll also be recorded for podcast. Um, Cause I really like podcasting. I think podcasting, is a phenomenal place to be uh, to out on the internet um, because you've got people, this is a whole nother discussion and I know we're, we're winding it down, but you know, podcasting people aren't necessarily live video or video people and vice versa. Um, and you're not, you know, I've heard from like Cliff has mentioned that it's not necessarily easy to bring people from podcast over into video and vice versa. So, you know, it's kind of nice if you can create content that can, that that's in a sense evergreen or uh, you know, it can go all these places. I know evergreen has more to do with uh, the longevity of it, but right. um, I guess it could also mean, you know, where does it apply? Is it good? Is the content something that the audio can go to podcast once you get the video off of it? I mean, yeah. Uh, right. So I think that's nice, right? Yeah. And people can, who, who don't have the time or the interest or aren't into participating in the, the live engagement and all that. Um, can still listen to it, download it, listen to it on the way to work when they're driving in their car, when they're working, when they're, you know, chilling out in the backyard or at the beach or wherever they, they have that podcast that they can take with them. And so the valuable information that you're giving out, uh, can, can reach more people who can make use of it just because they're not with you live or they're not scouring, uh, you know, Facebook and YouTube for replays doesn't mean that they shouldn't benefit from what you're producing and they shouldn't become part of your audience and a supporter and a, you know, customer or client or whatever it is that you're, that, that the end result is. Well, and a little pro tip as we're closing out, um, try ranking on YouTube or Google or, you know, try to get noticed on Facebook. It's oftentimes difficult, but, Go on uh, iTunes, and if you've properly formatted everything, um, let's say you want to talk about live video on iTunes, the you might be competing with maybe 20, 30 other people 
for certain uh, phrases and tags and things. And there's an enormous amount of people searching the podcast directory uh, where if the same exact content in a video format on YouTube, you might be competing with, uh, you know, 10,000 people for the same phrases. So, right. um, you know, you, you're to eliminate podcasting and, and to not send your live video sound audio to a podcast. I think, um, wow. I mean, think about it. I mean, it's just something to think about. Wow. Well, thanks again so much, Todd. It's great, great having you on. Todd.live is the website. Check it out. Tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern uh, on the Todd.live page, right? Yes. Todd.live page uh, with Professor Nez. Uh, it's Create and Engage is the name of the show. Create and Engage with Todd.live. Yeah. Live. Awesome. Yep. All right, so we're going to be back next week for the final episode of Season 5 of Livestream Stars. Jackie Meow from Dining Happy is joining us. If you're into food or if you just like to laugh, she is extremely funny, does a lot of different accents to go with the different kinds of food that she makes, and a great sense of humor. Met her at Summit Live and uh, can't wait to close out Season 5 with Jackie next week, 7 p.m. Eastern at rossbrand.live. Have a great evening, everybody. Bye, folks. Thanks, Ross.